this video is sponsored by Squarespace. I wasn't sold on Elden Ring when it was first announced. It struck me as a lazy copy and paste of Dark Souls 3 assets into a large map that was empty as far as I could tell from the trailers. It just didn't look like anything we hadn't seen before. But in an attempt to be a responsible YouTuber, insofar as such a thing can exist, I decided to withhold my opinion from public view and I simply waited until we saw more before I went and made a video on the game. And well, that day has come. We've seen more and I'm happy to report that I'm sold. And by sold, I mean I'm also hyped for the game and look forward to its inevitable release. Not that you should blindly go out and pre-order it even though we don't have reviews or any knowledge of what the game is actually like. Simply put, Elden Ring looks like it could be something genuinely special. It's combining some of the best parts of my favorite games. It's blending Breath of the Wild's map design and dynamic mini-bosses with Dark Souls combat mixed with Sekiro movement. The dungeon crawling and exploration that made games like The Elder Scrolls Oblivion and Skyrim so endlessly entertaining is being blended with the Chalice dungeons from Bloodborne, which featured some of the most challenging combat confrontations that I've ever encountered. I'm legitimately excited for this game now, and in this video I want to explain in detail the individual things that we've seen that show that this game could be something truly incredible. In other words, I'm going to gush for about 15 minutes on how good this game appears to be and how excited I am for it, so if you're willing to join me for the ride, hop on in, let's get going. But first I need to fund my coffee addiction, and give a huge thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is the website hosting and creation platform that's used by individuals and professionals alike. I've actually used Squarespace for years at this point to host my website LukeStevens.net and the websites for my startup companies like RhapsodyStream.com. I wasn't sponsored by them when I chose Squarespace to run my business's websites, but instead I just went with the best option on the market for me at the time, and that was, and still is, Squarespace. So you know that I actually do believe in the quality of their service and product, because I actually use Squarespace every single day and have had stable, dynamic, and beautiful websites running perfectly for years. Check them out at squarespace.com forward slash Luke Stevens, and make sure to use promo code Luke Stevens at checkout to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Now I want to discuss three key things that they showed off in the recent gameplay trailer that struck me as significant and worthy of conversation. These are the three things that changed my mind from being a skeptical pessimist surrounding Elden Ring to actually being a hyped up fan. Namely, the traversal, the dynamic combat encounters, and lastly, the dungeons. First, let's discuss the traversal system and the exploration of the world that they've crafted here. When I saw this gameplay trailer, what immediately stood out to me was just how vast the map appeared to be. As far as the horizon stretched, there seemed to be endless amounts of interesting, beautiful landmarks and breathtaking vistas. And while that's not enough to make a great game, it certainly makes a great first impression. The traversal system, as far as we can tell at least, is mainly comprised of running on foot or on the back of your mount. This is quite the change compared to previous titles from this team, and there's a very valid reason that they never bothered with mounts before this. It wasn't that From Software were just too lazy to develop something like this. In fact, we even saw in Sekiro a grapple hook mechanic that greatly improved exploration and level verticality, and it even varied the required movement tactics from level to level. It was simply that mounts were antithetical to what this team was known for doing so well. Specifically, the level design. Going back to Demon Souls, From Software has been consistently lauded for their ability to craft complicated interwoven levels that harbor new discoveries even dozens of hours after the player has first explored them. Adding a mount into a game like Bloodborne simply wouldn't work. Not only would the levels have to be greatly increased in terms of size, but navigating the streets of Yarnum would turn into more of a chore than a gameplay system that added to the experience. After all, part of what made these games so attractive is how there's always something new to be discovered around the next corner. A corner you will only see and think to look behind if you are moving slowly enough to notice it. So one must ask, why are they doing this now? Well, if the restriction previously was that they would have to forego the tight and intricately designed levels for sake of broad exploration, they've managed to bypass this frustrating limitation by simply doing more. 
Previously, the team had to choose between expansive, open levels that were perhaps more interesting to look at or allowed for larger boss fights, and tightly woven maps that revealed themselves to the player over a few hours. But thanks to the overwhelming success of their last several titles, budgetarily, the From Software team seems capable of implementing both. In this trailer, they show off extensive forests, grassy fields with cliffs on either side, and even tight dungeons that appear here to utilize the same level design that we've come to know and love in previous Dark Souls games. It's not just a consolidation here, it's an amalgamation. And while there's no way of telling whether or not this was a good choice in the long run, and whether or not it truly complements the combat system, what we do know is that this choice to greatly open the map serves one main purpose, and that is to encourage the player to explore the map and do so in their own way. This is reinforced in a number of ways. For one, you have the mount that speeds up traversal and the fast travel system that allows you to bounce between areas of interest that you've previously discovered. Though it is important to note that the game's director has already gone on record saying that he doesn't think that players should overuse this system or rely on it too heavily because there's a lot in the world that's worth discovering, something that can't be done while fast traveling. Secondly, there's the major shift that has been made to the leveling system. Unlike Dark Souls 3, this game is centered around gear, abilities, and even spells that are collected out in the world. There are occasions when you can purchase certain things that will improve the player's power and capabilities from stores, merchants, and NPCs, but for the most part, this is a game that's trying to encourage the player to explore all of its nooks and crannies, and we can see as much in the recently released footage, where the player character is literally jumping from rooftop to rooftop and busting into old castles through windows by way of off-beaten paths. And there's also a jump button now. Need I say more? I mean, I know that we had as much and more in Sekiro, but to see a game that is much more Dark Souls inspired giving the player such an ability, it's great to see. Now, in addition to the items and gear that needs to be discovered, there's also the fact that the team has put a lot of effort into making sure that the player can chart their own course. The game's director spoke of this in a recent interview with IGN, where he said, quote, there is a mainline route that they, the player, can follow, but at any time, they're free to break off this route and take the untrodden path. We want to focus on a design that caters to that high level of freedom, that free order of progression throughout the world, which order you can can choose to tackle the different areas, the different bosses, and how you approach each of them as well. You may get sent to a couple of areas against your will, but there's a lot of ways that you can explore and approach these different situations. In addition, he said, quote, there are six main areas of the lands between the game's map, and each of these six areas will house its own mainline dungeon map. These will be the domains or the areas of the main demigod bosses. All of this to say, the game has been designed from the ground up for the player to engage with it as they please, and you can take the bosses on in different orders, explore each of the six regions in whichever way you want to, and you can do all of this while using a vast assortment of different gear, spells, and abilities that are all paired with your unique playstyle. Now all told, this game is about exploration and discovering things you didn't expect to find, as far as all of the interviews have communicated to us. A great example of this would be the enemy encounters that are shown off in the trailer. It's not clear just how dynamic these are, but they do seem to occur while out in the world minding your own business in addition to staged boss fights. In this particular case, you can see that the player character is just riding along when a dragon comes out of nowhere to attack an enemy encampment and you get caught in the crossfire. All of a sudden, we're thrust into a boss fight, a boss fight we didn't expect. Now, it could be that this is simply a boss arena and the first time you encounter the boss triggers this cool intro, which they decided to include in the trailer. Or it could be that this is their way of showing us that there are these dynamic mini boss encounters, very similar to that of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild or The Witcher 3. And I, for one, am greatly hoping for the latter. After all, so much of what makes From Software games great is contained within the boss fights. Adding in all of these exploration and adventure elements is great so long as it doesn't lose sight of what made those other games so successful. And so, to combine the two with these dynamic encounters that reward the player with cool combat encounters for exploring, I think would be a great move. 
And speaking of boss fights, something I didn't expect to see at all are dungeons. From what we've been told, it seems as though each of the six major areas of the game will feature its own lengthy dungeon, and contained within these dungeons are bosses and puzzles. I can't express enough just how excited I am for these dungeons. Not only does this give From Software the ability to provide players with the tight and intricately designed levels that we all loved about the early Dark Souls games, but it also gives them the chance to throw some wacky bosses and mini bosses at the player. My favorite part of Bloodborne, regardless of how buggy it was, and even still is, has to be the Chalice Dungeons. And you don't even need to go through these to see the credits roll. They are completely optional. In fact, I wouldn't even be surprised if the majority of players didn't get through these dungeons. They do come off as randomly generated combat trials effectively, which in many ways, that is what they are, but each of these chalice dungeons ended in a boss fight, and some of these were certainly rehashes or reskins of fights from the core game, while others were group challenges, where a dozen or more small enemies from the core game were thrown at the player all at once, but there were also a good number of these bosses who don't make an appearance in the base game at all. They are completely unique to these chalice dungeons. Sure, their hitboxes might not be perfect, or a base PS4 might begin to melt while trying them because they're not very well optimized or balanced for the hardware, but it doesn't change the fact that these dungeons offered some of the most interesting content that Bloodborne had to offer. And that's saying something. Unfortunately, this system was very poorly communicated to the player, so many people don't even know that they existed, or at least not to this extent. But in Elden Ring, it seems as though From Software is going to try this again. As far as I can tell, given the information that we have as of the time of the recording of this video, these aren't going to be randomly generated rooms that stretch endlessly and then have a boss fight at the very end of a large arena that's stitched onto the end of the generated path. Rather, it seems as though these are dungeons that are handcrafted by the development team that are designed to challenge the player in various ways that they might not face while out exploring the world. Now, there's no word as of yet referencing whether or not these dungeons are optional or if they need to be completed in their entirety to get to the end of the game but I'm sure we'll find out closer to launch if these are designated as side content or not, but all I can say is that they have a lot of potential. Again, this is something I did not expect to see at all in Elden Ring, and so to see it now, for me at least, is very intriguing. Now, there are other elements too that we haven't addressed, such as the narrative that George R. R. Martin has helped to develop, the improved magic systems that were shown off extensively, and even the online component. But they're all too numerous to discuss here in this short video, and we know too little about them at this point to hold any sort of informed discussion on them. As the game's launch approaches, we may find that we can pontificate upon them, but for now, we'll leave it there. I could also point out some of the unfortunate elements as well, such as the recycled assets and animations, or the fact that the game is cross-generational, limiting its potential, potentially. And I could even point to the lack of classic action RPG mechanisms that we saw back in the old Dark Souls games, but that here seem largely absent. But as I mentioned before, I don't think criticizing such things is valid until we have a final product in our hands. I mean, we can theorize about the performance and how it will be limited in next generation machines, or I suppose at this point it's current generation machines, but it very well could be that the game will indeed reach its maximum potential even while catering to gamers on older systems, something which I would say is a very good thing. The more gamers that get to experience this, the better. Or it could be that while the combat system is less complicated, it could end up being easier to engage with, leading to more players experimenting with it in different play styles than they would normally use to tackle a game like this. The point is, if I wanted to be pedantic, I could make endless videos poking holes in everything that the trailers present, but until it launches, there's no way of knowing whether or not these critiques are truly valid. So I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to feed that rage machine that shouldn't be running in the first place. Instead, I will wait patiently to see what the game has to offer. The point is, there's a lot of things that this game looks to be doing that are exciting and intriguing. And furthermore, 
There's no studio better equipped, as far as I'm concerned, than From Software to combine all of these systems in a unique and captivating way. I wasn't excited at all for Elden Ring, but now I cannot wait. If you enjoyed it, please like this video, subscribe to this channel and ring the bell, and follow my social media to get notified of new videos or even be featured in them. Thank you for watching. I love you all. I'll see you in the next video.